Good morning to those of you who are in Europe and uh, good afternoon to those of you who are tuning in from uh, Japan. I'm Yudita Rikamadar, the country representative for Europe South Japan, and a very warm welcome to Taylor and Francis today, who are represented by KTP. Uh, she is the senior publisher for book publishing in Asia Pacific. And Andrew is here to give us a presentation about getting your first academic book published in engineering. And he is a books commissioning editor for engineering with CRC Press. He commissions all types of books content in all fields of engineering from authors across Asia and has a very background related to academic book publishing and publishing in general, both the UK and Japan. And he understands how challenging it could be for non-native English speakers to actually write a book and all the difficulties that um, they face during the writing process. So he will share his knowledge with early career researchers today and uh, experienced academics who are looking to publish their first, second or third book for the international audience. He's tuning in from Fukuoka. So welcome Katie and welcome Andrew. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction, Judith. Um, just before we get started, so today we'll be in English, but before we get started, I would just like to um, say a few words in Japanese, if I may. Um, I think it might be helpful for anyone who's watching. Um, okay, so Judith san ni go shokai itadaita tori, eto tashi wa CRC Press no Andrew Stop to moshimas. よろしくお願いします。えっと、コミッショニングエディター、と、本日のセミナーは、えっと、できるだけ簡単な英語で、え、話しますか。ちょっと分かりにくければ、あの、質問してください。えっと、それは英語でも日本語でもいいです。うーん。あと、あの、セミナーの後では、あの、ぜひ
Uh, just a quick note that the information here today uh, will be broadly applicable, not just to CRC Press, but to any publisher. Uh, so while we really love it, um, if you would publish with us, um, and I would absolutely love to hear your ideas for your, uh, your research and book ideas, um, the information isn't just applicable to us, so you can apply it for anyone. So hopefully it's, it's really useful for you, regardless of um, whatever route you go down with your publishing. So first of all, who is CRC Press? So we were founded as a publisher in uh, 1973. We actually go back um, to as far back as 1903, uh, but we became a publisher in 1973 and joined Taylor and Francis uh, in 2003. So we are a premier science, technology, and medical resource publisher. So we're the STEM branch of Taylor and Francis, essentially. Um, as part of Taylor and Francis, uh, Taylor and Francis is one of the, the top five global academic publishers. Uh, we publish 7,000 new books every year, uh, not just in STEM, but in all fields, and over 2,600 journals. Uh, we have a back catalogue of um, almost 150,000 titles, um, and we're constantly adding to this every single year. Um, what this really means is that... Um, Having such a wide scope is that we can really focus on uh, more niche elements and really focus on um, you know, specific studies, um, new technologies, and all these kind of niche areas that uh, researchers are looking into now. Uh, because of our size, we have a great global sales and marketing reach as well. Uh, we've got offices in 18 countries across uh, the Americas, across Europe, uh, and in the Asia Pacific uh, region. And we have, um, we have um, what's the word, uh, reps um, in many other countries um, around the world. So we can really get out there and market and sell your book. Um, so that is essentially who CRC Press is. So we'll look now at uh, what to do when you're starting out. So the first question that you really got to ask is why would we want to write a book? Um, I think particularly with engineering, a lot of uh, university departments are very focused on um, journal publishing and a lot of uh, researchers like yourselves, um, you have uh, essentially quotas that you will need to publish a certain number of journal articles per year. Uh, despite this, there are a, a few real advantages and great reasons why you should think about book publishing. So the first of these is um, that book publishing essentially enables you to stake your claim to ideas and to um, progress your career by really highlighting uh, the importance of your work. Uh, one of the ways that you can do this is by collecting all of your work in one place. Um, with journal publishing, for example, you may publish in different journals um, all over the place. And what this means is that um, often readers may not see everything you're publishing because some of it may be behind paywalls, uh, others may not um, have access to these. So really bringing them all together means that researchers can read all of your research. Um, the book um, is therefore more accessible to other people and it has longer term relevance. Um, the reason for this is that if you search on the CRC Press uh, shop, or on Amazon or anything like that, um, you will see that uh, for a lot longer. Whereas I think with a journal article, if you put the keywords into the journal or into Google Scholar, uh, your article may get lost eventually behind more recent uh, articles in that field. So um, there's um, definitely uh, advantages when it comes to longevity um, of your research when it comes to book publishing. Um, some other areas that you can explore with book publishing are to create your own textbook. So any courses that you're teaching, uh, you may feel, for example, that the uh, textbooks available don't actually cover um, the information that you need. They may not be up to date. Um, so this is a real opportunity for you to actually um, put something out there and put your stamp on it and get your name out there. And then that means that in that way you can influence future students. Um, when writing in English in particular, you're participating in international exchange uh, and extending your network. So as many of you um, are in Europe as well, as you know, um, working with people around the world can lead to brand new opportunities. Uh, you can visit overseas as visiting professors, uh, expand your network and really further your career. So the question is um, now, well, 
I want to write a book, but where do I start? Um, a book project can be really scary, uh, especially I think for non-native English speaking authors, trying to get down your thoughts and organizing your thoughts and your ideas in a second language is incredibly challenging. So hopefully we can make this a bit simpler for you. Um, so basically deciding where to start is really important for deciding um, your direction and your scope of your book project. So I recommend, first of all, just deciding whether you actually have enough information um, or enough research behind you to actually write a book. Um, if you've only conducted maybe one small study or um, a few journal articles, you maybe don't have enough at this point um, for a book project. Uh, so my advice would be focus a little bit more on the uh, journal publications, get more publication experience, and then in a couple of years, maybe you can think about bringing all of this research experience together into a book. So the first step is to develop your idea. Um, so think about what your book is about. So it can't be about all of your research. You want to think about maybe one particular research project. Uh, you could use your PhD thesis, which I'll talk about in a moment. Or you could use, for example, a conference paper that you recently published um, as the basis for your book. So start thinking about what story you want to tell, and then you can start shaping your ideas around that. Next, you want to think, who is your book for? And why does the audience need it? Or why do they want it? So you want to think, what's going to make them buy your book? What's going to make them read your book? And what's going to make them cite your book? So then think about what's it going to do better than the competition? So similar to journal article publication, try to identify what the gap in the current publication um, scene is, what the gap in the current knowledge is, and focus on that. Um, and that way you will identify that there is a, a market for what you're writing. Um, you can develop your idea by discussing it with other people. And I think this is a really useful um, idea, a really useful tool. Um, speak with your colleagues, um, whether in your department or whether further afield. Um, you can speak with other authors who've been published, or you can speak with people like me, commissioning editors. Um, so if you've got an idea, get in touch with the commissioning editor and get in touch with me. And I'm always really happy to, to hear your ideas. It's one of the things that I really love about this job is um, having meetings and calls with authors and just hearing about some of the most like, incredible research that they're doing and helping them to kind of frame this and shape it into a book idea. Um, it's a real, uh, a real huge positive part of my job. So please reach out and speak to people. So I mentioned just now publishing from your PhD. Um, so there are a few considerations if you want to do this. So notice that it isn't publishing your PhD, but it's using your PhD as the basis. So first of all, uh, don't copy and paste direct from your thesis. Um, you will need to modify um, the content. So for example, changing the introduction, removing the literature review part, um, and also changing like the way that you've written it, changing the style so that it has more of a wider audience than just your university uh, professors. You should also think about expanding the work so that you have additional data. Um, so conducting additional experiments, updating the research that you're doing. Essentially, anything that you can do that will expand your conclusions. Yes. Apologies. I, I think you might be breaking up a bit. Um, I'm oh, okay. Sure it's only a problem at my end. Okay, let me try something and see if I can fix that. There was a bit of an echo and then you were gone um, for almost 30 seconds. Okay, okay. How is it now? Is it better? Yeah, it's, it's definitely better. Thank you so much. Apologies okay, great. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so I will go back a little bit. Um, so basically, when you're writing your PhD, um, or your book based on your PhD, um, essentially modify the content and the language uh, so that you have more of a wider audience 
and then expand the content um, so that the more you can expand your conclusions, the more you can expand the scope of your, um, of your book, the larger the market will be and the stronger your book project will be. Okay, so you've identified your audience um, and now the best thing to do is think about the best type of book that you can write. So depending on your audience, you have a few different options. First of all, if your audience is researchers, um, then some options are the following. Uh, first, we have monographs. Um, so very often these are single author or they can be multi-authored books um, that can be between 50 and 100,000 words, uh, generally 60 to 80,000. And in this, you take an idea or a research project in some depth and you provide other researchers with information about what you've done, uh, what you found, and what the implications are going forward for other researchers and for industry or for the field as a whole. Uh, your second option would be an edited collection. Uh, so in this case, rather than write the entire book yourself, you would serve as um, the editor and you would uh, then commission or you would search for contributors who would each write a chapter in this case, it would be your uh, responsibility to ensure that the chapters had a consistent theme, um, that there's a theme running through the book, and that it's not just um, chapters with little connection to each other. So these often are really good for kind of providing a um, kind of state of the research uh, to give an overview of what's happening in the field or discussing um, particular issues surrounding a new technology or a new technique or anything that you're conducting your research on. Um, they might come out of collaboration with your colleagues in your department or with um, conferences where you meet with other researchers who are in the same field as you. Um, another option, which is really great, I think, for um, particularly junior researchers, is what we call the CRC focus. Um, now, the idea of these is that they sit essentially between journal publishing on the one hand and monograph publishing on the other hand. Um, so these are much shorter. Uh, they're between 20 and 50,000 words. And so they're longer than a journal article, but a lot less writing involved than a monograph. Um, now, with these, you're writing about what is happening in the field now. So they're very immediate and focused on the current uh, state of knowledge, the current state of affairs, and the current, um, the current research outlooks within your field. Um, so with these the publications a lot quicker, once they're submitted, they're generally published and available to buy within three months of the writing being finished. So the idea is you write a lot quicker and then you get them published a lot quicker as well. Uh, lastly, we have handbooks, which are essentially our uh, prestige publication. So these really kind of take an in-depth view of a whole field or a sub-discipline and provide um, an overview of all of the issues surrounding that. Um, so they're edited collections um, and basically they have a real mix of authors. Um, so they wouldn't be just authors from within Japan, but they would have uh, an international focus. So authors from all over the globe and uh, all different stages of their research. So you would want uh, some big names in the field. You would want junior researchers and people everywhere, at every stage of their career in between. Um, so you're kind of bringing in different voices from different stages and different, um, different locations to bring in information there. Okay, if you wanted to write for students, uh, the main option here would be to write a textbook. Um, now, these are prescribed reading on courses, um, so here you might identify that course that you teach um, needs a textbook, and essentially these are aimed at introducing students to a subject, and so you would want a different writing style to be a bit more um, casual in the way you write and more engaging for a student audience. Again, these are about 50 to 100,000 words, but again, they can be longer. Um, the success of these books really depends on um, essentially your research into the market. 
So the more courses, the more universities that this is applicable to, uh, the more um, essentially the more you will sell and the more successful the book will be. Lastly, um, we offer books as well for professionals, which we call practitioner or professional books. Um, so these are essentially aimed at people working uh, generally in industry or um, potentially in government agencies and government institutions and things like this. Um, so um, if you're looking to publish then that is another option. Just to talk really quickly about ebooks. Uh, now, every book that we publish, um, we publish a hard copy and we publish uh, the ebook at the same time. Uh, we offer a couple of models. Um, generally, the ebooks are what we call verbatim. Uh, so that means it's exactly the same book um, with the text formatted uh, for the specific ebook reader. Uh, so, whether that's a Kindle or a PDF or whatever format uh, the readers have. Uh, we also offer interactive textbooks. Uh, so these contain things like hyperlinks, embedded videos, uh, figures where you can rotate and zoom in, uh, which is particularly useful for uh, complex diagrams. Um, interactive questions so that students can test their learning and their knowledge and other elements. Uh, we offer ebooks in over 20 formats. So regardless of what the reader uh, uses to read their ebooks, there will be a format to suit. Uh, please just note though that ebooks are not endlessly updatable. Uh, they're not the same as a blog post. And so um, it's not the same as you can keep updating the information. Um, the updating process will be the same as with a standard book. Okay, just key points uh, to take away regarding starting out. First of all, you want to develop your idea, identify your audience, and determine the most appropriate book type. So uh, all of these points, it's really good to talk with your colleagues, uh, talk with commissioning editors, uh, talk with other authors who have published before, and all of these will give you a better idea of where you want to go, and then that will help you prepare for your proposal. A book proposal. Uh, once you've decided on the type of book, it's time to write the proposal. So your first goal is to get me to say yes to your proposal and want to send the proposal off for peer review. Um, so my role here is to help you really polish this proposal and get it to be really high quality to ensure that it's well received at peer review. So there's a bit of back and forth at this stage between you as the author and between me as the commissioning editor, where I'll offer you advice and help to really kind of get this to the highest quality. So again, uh, like I said, this is um, generally, um, the information is generally applicable across publishers. Uh, this is what our proposal form looks like. Um, others may be different, but generally the information will be the same. So with this proposal form, we ask that you fill it in in as much detail as possible. The more detail you provide, the stronger your proposal form will be. So first of all, we ask you about the title and the subtitle. Um, don't worry too much at this stage. Um, don't think that if you write a title here, that has to be your title. The book title will change um, throughout the uh, production process, so don't worry too much. Um, but what you should focus on is keeping the title as simple as possible, and including as many key words and key points as possible. Um, the idea is that if someone goes to search for it on the CRC Press shop or on Amazon or anywhere else, if they put in the keywords, the first thing that should come up should be your book. Um, I think there's a lot of um, temptation maybe to try and write a, a funny title or a clever title using a pun or a joke or something like that. Um, my advice is not to do it. Um, it looks good at first, but then you realise that it really kind of makes your book not discoverable and it's a bit of a disadvantage to do that. So keep it simple and include as many keywords as you can. Uh, next on here, we ask you to explain the rationale. So essentially, why are you writing this book? Um, so why is there a need? So here really show that you know um, the field that you're researching and you know what the publication um, scene looks like and what the gaps in the publication are. 
And the synopsis part is really important because this is where you include a lot of the um, um, supporting information. Um, so including the overview of the book and the statement of the aim, include a list of the chapter headings. And again, like the book title, you want these to be simple, include keywords and really give a clear indication of what is in the chapter. Uh, we ask you to include an abstract of each chapter, um, usually about 200 words. Uh, so and the flow of this and ensure that there's a, a consistent theme running through Nook. Uh, if you have it available, please also include a sample chapter. Um, that's really useful for the uh, They can see you know, your writing stuff information to the readers and they can really get a better sense of what your completed book will look like. Um, then we just ask you about things like um, how long you expect your book to be. Uh, we also ask you to include the sound bite, which will appear on the back cover of the book. Um, so this is just another way that you can really try and draw the reader in their attention and then encourage them to, uh, to buy your book. Uh, here we ask for catch words. So six, up to six, sorry, minimum of six keywords that will help uh, readers to identify and find your book when they're doing a search online. For anyone who is uh, wanting to submit an edited book, like we discussed previously, there are some additional chapters, uh, sorry, additional questions. So why have you selected these collaborators? Why have you selected these chapters? Uh, so again, you're really showing that you've thought about the content, you've thought about the audience for your book, and that you have a consistent theme running through, even though you have different uh, collaborators coming in from, from different places. Uh, next, the readership and the market. So we want you to um, show that you know, that you've thought about um, and that you understand who, who is going to read your book and who is going to buy it. Um, so we ask, for example, that if you think uh, your book will be good as inclusion for recommended reading or as a textbook, um, that you name specific courses, specific modules that that will be useful for. The benefit of doing this in this proposal, again, is that you're showing the reviewers that you know that there's a clear market for your book and that once it's written, that you expect it to sell and be relevant and that it will have a, a lot of longevity. Again, competition, so talking about your unique selling point. What is it that your book does better and uniquely and um, really makes it stand out from every other book that is currently being published? So really, really trying to sell your book as much as possible during this stage. So when you do the proposal, the publishers are looking for a few things. They're looking for originality. They're looking for a clearly defined market. So showing that you know who you're writing for and why you're writing. They're looking for either regional relevance or international appeal or both. They're looking for a good author. Um, what we mean by this is not someone who's published a lot. Um, it doesn't matter if this is your first book. What we mean by good author is that someone who is willing to listen to the publisher, uh, willing to listen to the commissioning editor, take feedback on board and make any changes as necessary. Um, so basically anybody who um, is really easy to work with and we know is likely to produce a high quality book that has taken on board the feedback that has been given to them. So it doesn't need to be a barrier that you haven't written before or that you're not perfect at English or anything like that. Don't worry about that. Just as long as you're uh, eager to listen and engage and take feedback on board. Uh, we're looking for quality of research as well. That's a really important thing for us here. Um, the peer review process is um, quite strenuous, but we ensure because of that, that we have the highest quality. Um, we're looking again for clear language and structure. So like I say, you don't need to be perfect at English, um, but it is important uh, that um, the copy editors can understand what it is you're trying to say. If at least they can understand your meaning, then we can polish the uh, 
the language and get that to a professional standard before the book is produced. So essentially what publishers are looking for is quality and sales potential. Okay, so our key points from the proposal are that it's important to promote yourself and your idea equally, provide a full summary of the project and the subject area with as much detail as you can include, include chapter abstracts and a sample chapter if possible. And remember that uh, your book project is judged on this proposal. So whereas a journal, um, um, journal submission would be based on the whole article here, we're basing it on these documents that you're submitting now. Okay, so you've submitted the proposal. What are the next steps? So it will go for peer review. So first of all, um, I will receive the proposal and I'll make an initial assessment. Um, and so here there'll be some discussion between the commissioning editor and between the author about any areas that maybe you found difficult during the, um, during the proposal. And then we can work together to uh, polish those and make sure that the proposal is really of the, of the highest quality. Uh, then when that's ready, we'll send that out to the reviewers. Uh, we usually send it to two or three uh, reviewers um, and we give them usually six to eight weeks uh, to review your um, proposal. It can be occasionally up to 12 weeks as well, so um, because the reviewers are all, as you are, uh, very busy, um, so we sometimes give them a little bit more time. The reviewer comments then come back and just like a journal article, um, they say they accept. Uh, accept with minor amendments or major amendments or in a minority of cases reject. Um, then basically we as commission editors will take all of these points and we'll put them together um, so that when we return the feedback to you it's clear what action you need to take. Um, sometimes the peer review comments aren't particularly clear and it's not particularly clear what they want you to do. So again, we will work with you, um, make it clear how you can improve uh, your proposal if necessary. You'll then make the necessary changes and it will then go to the publishing committee. And I will then speak with the uh, publishing committee, explain why your proposal and why your book is so great and when they say yes to publishing, we can then move forward with the contract. So that process generally takes 10 to 12 weeks, depending on um, the speed of the peer review process. But the contract uh, contains terms like your royalty, your word count, and your schedule for delivery. Uh, basically, at this point, you should commit to a delivery date um, for the manuscript, though please note that we understand how busy you are with um, all of the areas of your research, teaching, administrative elements at the university. So we can be flexible with this, but uh, just that we have a general idea of when you aim to submit uh, your book. Some important points regarding the contract are as follows. So it's really important to note that you earn a royalty on every book that you sell. So you'll get a small percentage of the fee uh, every time we sell one of your books. And please note that we don't charge a publishing fee. So it doesn't cost you anything to publish with us. We don't charge any fees. We cover the cost of the copy editing, the typesetting, of the printing, uh, production, and selling of the book. Uh, you return, retain the copyright and the moral rights related to the material. So at the front of the book, it will give the copyright symbol and then your name will be there. Uh, one thing that you do license to us is the right to allow others to translate uh, the book into other languages. Um, so they will pay us a fee to do so, and then we will pass on a percentage of that fee back to you. So if it gets translated into any other language, you will receive a small fee for that as well. Lastly, book metadata goes into databases like uh, Scopus, uh, Web of Science, uh, Dimensions, um, all of these things. So basically, um, whenever someone searches for you as a, as a researcher, this book will appear um, there as well, and it will be connected with your, with your name. So that will be useful for you when 
trying to further your career. Okay, the book publishing timeline is generally as follows. So we've had the proposal and peer review. Uh, so depending on how long that takes to write and how long the peer review takes, it can take between two and six months. Then when we've had the contract signed, um, you move on to the writing stage. Um, so depending on the book type and the amount of time you have to write, uh, that can take generally anywhere between three months to two years. Um, it can take longer, but generally um, we encourage people to try and do it um, quickly if possible, because it's better you know, to maintain that, uh, the momentum and the motivation to write. Uh, once you submit the completed manuscript to us, um, it goes through production. So we copy edit it, uh, like I say, just to polish the language and make sure um, there are no grammatical typographical errors. And we typeset it so that it looks beautiful. And then it will be sent for proofing. So it will go to an editor and also to you for proofing. Um, both of you will make any changes as necessary. Then those come back to us and we incorporate the changes. And that essentially takes four to six months to get your book ready for publication. Once we're ready, we then uh, put the book and we undertake sales and marketing activities uh, to ensure that um, sales of your book are high and that interest in the book is high. Uh, so that's an ongoing uh, process after, after publication. So after publication, there are a couple of things that you as authors can also do to ensure success. Um, these include kind of selling and promoting your book. Um, now, I think maybe as an author, it can sometimes feel a little bit unnatural, maybe a little bit uncomfortable trying to you know, promote your own work, but it's really vital that you do this and it's really important um, and it's really beneficial that you do this as well. So there are a few places that you can do this. Um, first of all, academic networking sites. So um, J Research, J Global, uh, ResearchGate, Research Map, all of these places promote your work on their um, promote uh, on social media as well. So if you have LinkedIn, it's a great idea to just write a post, um, share it in any groups that you're members of, and really get that information out there that you've written this book. Um, there are a few things within your university that you can do. So you can promote it on your department website. Um, have it included in your students' reading lists. Um, and if you feel that your work um, is particularly important or particularly impactful, um, speak with your institution's press office and they can put out a press release as well. Uh, so that might get picked up by newspapers and then there'll be a, an article in the general press about your work. Um, many of you may have blogs or personal web pages, so it's a great idea to write about your work on there as well. Uh, you can create a short video or author interview, which we can include on the CRC Press website um, on your book page. Um, so basically, you would then describe your work, describe who it's for, uh, describe the conclusions and why it's particularly useful. So it's just another really good way of selling your book and having more engagement with your readers. Um, if you don't want to do any of these, we say at the very least, you should include a link in your email signature. So anytime you're sending out an email, the person or people who are reading your emails will see this link and they may be intrigued and have a look and uh, you may get a sale out of it. So it's always a good idea. Um, just very quickly, what uh, we can do for you in marketing and sales. Uh, so we have really very varied marketing activities, uh, including conference attendance, uh, email campaigns and catalogs. Um, we're very active on social media, so we really get out there when our authors uh, publish books, and we really try to kind of promote that on social media. Uh, we send review copies out uh, to reviewers. Um, we actually ask during the proposal that if there are any journals that you would like to see a review of your book, that you should suggest those as well. Uh, so basically, if your book is reviewed in any journals, um, it's another great way of uh, people in the same field um, seeing that you've got a book out and promoting the work to them. And we have sales teams internationally. Like I mentioned, where we have offices in 18 countries and sales reps 
all around the globe. Uh, these really help to get your book out to the right people. Um, and you know, like I say, sales offices and reps are really out there to kind of proactively sell your book uh, to institutions and individual readers. A special sales team uh, arranges deals with organizations uh, on the ebook sales team, we create uh, bespoke packages for university libraries and institutions to really encourage them to get your book and get that out there to students and to other researchers and faculty members. So I mentioned open access. Um, I'll really briefly talk about this. Um, it's not the focus of this presentation, but it is, I think, really important for you to know about. Uh, because it's a way that you can maximize your research impact as well. Um, I'll give you some brief information now. But, uh, please note that your access will actually be giving another seminar in December about open access. So please keep an eye out in your email inboxes for some more information uh, with the date confirmation on that. Okay, the main benefit of open access um, is that your book or your chapter can be read by anybody, anywhere. So many of you may already have open access experience through journal publishing. Um, so it's essentially the same, the same uh, process here with the book or with the chapter. Um, it's really useful because it enables your book or your chapter to be more uh, likely to be read or cited. Um, open access book chapters are actually downloaded seven times more than non-open access titles. Um, they're cited 50% more, and they're actually mentioned online 10 times more than non-open access articles. So it's a really great way to make sure that people are talking about your research and that your research is being cited. So it's the same rigorous peer review process. Uh, the only difference is that um, the payment for the um, access to the book shifts from the reader to the funding institution. So we charge the research funder or the institution once the manuscript has been reviewed and submitted. So essentially, if you can get funding from your university or from your institution or any other funding body, then we really encourage you to do this because of the benefits uh, that it has. Um, if you've already published, then you can get retrospective open access. Um, you can get up to a 70% discount to do so. Uh, so it's a huge benefit there. Um, and if you can't get the funding for your entire book to be open access, you can um, have individual chapters open access and then later on maybe switch to having the entire book open access. So there's a few different options that are open to you there regarding this. Um, like I say, there will be a presentation in December. So keep an eye out please for that. Um, I've just included a link here um, with information about open access on our website. So please, um, if you want more information, please take a look there. Lastly, um, I just want to mention author directions. Um, so these are some author resources on our website. Um, all of the information that I've given you today is available here. Um, you can download it in a PDF. Um, I believe you can get a physical copy as well, if you prefer. Uh, please go to the link that I've included here. Uh, take a look around there. Um, we have lots of resources for authors um, regarding what to do before publication, what to do after publication. We have templates and guidelines for writing the proposal, um, information on contacts uh, within our editorial team, who to, to, who to get in contact with about what, um, much, much more. So please, um, it's really worth taking a note of this link and uh, taking a look at this website after the, after the seminar. So I've actually managed to come in inside 45 minutes, which I'm quite happy about. I thought I was going to run over. Um, I know that that was really quite a lot of information. Um, like I said, I tried to keep it uh, as simple as possible, um, but um, if you have questions, then please feel free to ask now. If you don't have anything you want to ask now, um, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. 
Uh, my email address is on screen. Uh, my Twitter handle is on screen as well. Uh, so please uh, get in touch. Um, happy to answer any questions, uh, discuss any book ideas or any just your research ideas or anything like that. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was very informative. And we have learned a lot about open access and the various uh, means of publishing uh, books in different engineering topics. And I would like to invite Katie, please, to the Q&A session as well. So let me just relay the few questions to you that we've been uh, uh, listing here. Oh. Okay, so the first question, can I reuse some of my existing journal articles in a book project? Um, the answer to that is yes, uh, that's absolutely fine. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, with journal publication, it's very often the case that um, researchers may publish in various different journals. And because of that, um, other researchers and readers may not have access to all of the work um, that you've been doing. And so one of the advantages of writing a book is that you can really consolidate all of this research in one place. Um, a related question that we get asked about this is that, is it okay to do that? Because um, if there's nothing new, is that okay? Um, so what we say is that you can repackage this and repurpose it, and we really recommend that you add something new here. So the idea is that if there's another researcher who has read um, all of your work previously, if they buy this book, there's still something new in that for them, there's new information, um, and it's a great opportunity for you to use what you've written before, update the information, uh, particularly in engineering, the speed at which technology is advancing, uh, which the applications of the technology are broadening. It's a great opportunity to kind of expand your previous work and use that as a basis for a book. Thank you so much. The next question is, how do I get hold of a book proposal form to complete? So book proposal form. Um, yeah, if I go back one slide, um, this link here, so routledge.com slash resources slash authors, uh, you'll be able to find them there. Um, if you can't, just send me an email and I'll, I'll send you one. Thank you so much. Um, how long is a standard research book? Um, so a standard monograph can be anywhere between 50 and 100,000 words. Um, they're generally maybe 60 to 80,000. Um, I think when you say it like that, that sounds really scary, quite daunting. Um, so that, that's why we say maybe using some of your previous research as a basis for that is a really great way to go about writing a book because you start with a basis and then you can adapt it. Um, it makes it a lot easier than just sitting down at zero and thinking, ah, I need to write 100,000 words now. Um, yeah, but that's the length, 50 to 100,000. If it's longer, that's okay as well. Thank you so much. And um, another question, which kind of links to a previous question, do you have a template for writing um, the book? I, I guess writing books would be more appropriate in a question form. Um, for writing the book itself, um, we don't have a template, I believe. Um, what I would recommend is to look at what we've actually published recently uh, in the field. Um, so take a look in your university library. Um, if you've got any ebooks or anything like that, take a look at that. Um, last week, actually, I was discussing with uh, an author about his book project, and he wasn't really sure what type of book he wanted to write. Uh, but he had a CRC press book with him and he said, I want to use this as the template. And I think that's a really great way to do it. You know, you can start by looking at how they've structured their chapters, uh, structured the ideas within their chapters. Um, so that's something that you could use yourself and then start filling out your own information. And that's, I think that's a really great way of, of doing it. Yeah, a really great way of going about it. Yeah, just to add to that, um, it's, it's also great to look at... Um, anybody that you've cited in your own, you know, journal articles and seeing if they've written a book and, and kind of, you know, having a look at their, their materials as well, because that's a, a great way of getting a sense of not only, you know, making sure that you're really abreast of what's going on in the, the field, but also 
as, we, as uh, Andrew said, you know, looking at kind of what other content is there and what someone else's writing style has been like as well. Thank you, Katie. Um, again, those of you who are in the system now, I would like to encourage you to send us your questions via chat. Um, if you're shy, you can send it privately, publicly. You can also type in the Q&A box as you prefer. Um, our email is also live at japan at euroaccess.net. So please let us know your questions. Uh, another question, I'm interested in publishing my PhD thesis as a book. Should I submit a proposal or a chapter? Um, both, um, essentially. So um, what I would recommend is getting in touch with me um, and I'll give you some advice and some help regarding the proposal writing. Um, so the proposal is really um, very important. Um, as I was saying, it's a great way to uh, sell yourself as a researcher and also sell your, um, your research and explain um, to explain to the uh, reviewers um, how you are going to adapt um, your PhD into a book. Um, using, um, using your PhD to write a sample chapter is also really great because it allows the reviewers to see how you're going to adapt the content uh, to suit a new audience, um, how you're going to um, also maybe expand the scope of your research and update um, some of the data and the information that is actually contained within there. So really doing both, um, I think, is a really great way to strengthen your submission and make it more likely that the peer reviewers will recommend that we go ahead and publish your book. Yes, I, I think it's one of the most challenging uh, uh, tasks for early career researchers, you know, to uh, sort of convert their PhD thesis into a book that's available to a more general public. Yes. Um, next question. Yeah. Is it a way to change the title and authors after the contract has been signed? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it is OK to change the title. Um, but um, you should do so in consultation with us. Um, so we'll have a discussion amongst, amongst ourselves about um, why you want to change it. And then we'll discuss about how to, um, like I say, optimize the title to optimize the discoverability. Um, maybe we can include more keywords, uh, rephrasing things to be clearer about what the content of your book actually is. Um, but yeah, please don't feel that um, once we have the title that that's set, um, if you want to change it or if you have suggestions for improvements, then we are absolutely, um, yeah, okay, absolutely happy to help you in help, uh, improving that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, yet another query. Do you have a US or a UK spelling preference? Um, we don't, I mean, we're an international publisher, um, so we don't have a preference for spelling type. Um, all we ask is essentially that you um, are consistent throughout. So um, if it's a single author book, it's obviously a lot easier to make sure that you're writing in the same, uh, same spelling type. If you are the editor of an edited volume, uh, please make sure that all of the different contributors um, use the same spelling type in their chapters so that we don't have uh, a mishmash throughout of uh, UK spelling and US spelling or Canadian, Australian or anything like that. Um, keep it consistent all the way through, basically. Yeah, so basically consistency is the key word, not only in spelling, but also in other formatting options, I believe. Um, Absolutely, yes. Possible. Yeah. Yes, and also terminology, yeah. most likely. I um, often um, hear from publishers that terminology often changes throughout the paper and um, you know the chapter. So again, consistency is key. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Published... Judith, sorry, just to go ahead. Sorry, just to add in also, um, which relates to the question earlier about a book. Um, you know the the sort of um, template as well. We do have a very comprehensive set of author guidelines. So we can send that information to any authors that's interested in, and we can give an example, a sort of formatted sample chapter. So if anyone's uncertain about how to format the book um, or, you know, how to kind of go about um, 
whether we accept endnotes or footnotes or all the different uh, formatting issues, we can send all of that information to any author that wants to, to have it. Um, it's yes, very comprehensive, but, but as Andrew said, it's about consistency and um, making sure that everybody within the book is, is doing the same thing as on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, one question is, do you actually accept other formats than the prescribed formatting um, that uh, prospective authors receive. For example, if um, the person has submitted their work to um, you know, a different uh, company and they would like to use the same format, is that acceptable or you prefer your own formatting in the initial process, in the initial submission? Uh, do you mean for the proposal form? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes, um, yeah, we do prefer that uh, you use our um, proposal form. Um, the reason for that is that just that, again, consistency and that our reviewers um, and ourselves in-house, um, we know exactly what information we're looking for. Um, if you have previously submitted with another publisher, um, but you decide that you'd like to submit with us, uh, first of all, that's great. Um, second of all, um, I'm more than happy to discuss with you about how to adapt uh, the content in the previous proposal form and adapt it um, to fit uh, or to meet the requirements of our proposal form. Um, but yeah, we ask that you do use ours because um, it just makes things a lot simpler, a lot quicker. It ensures that our peer review process, um, the quality is higher, and it means that the feedback that we can give you is therefore a lot better and will help you uh, to improve your book at the end. Um, I just just a, a small plea on this though. Um, sometimes people do submit book proposals to more than one publisher at the same time. It's not unacceptable. Um, as it would be in journal publishing, uh, to send it to more than one book publisher. But I would always ask that you're honest about the fact that your book proposal is under submission by more than one publisher. Um, it can be quite awkward if we send your book proposal to the same set of reviewers. Um, and it, you know, it just doesn't often make you look that great um, that you're kind of you know, playing a few different publishers off against each other. So my suggestion would be try and stick to one publisher, your kind of preferred publisher, and wait for a response um, from them first. But, but if you do need to, for whatever reason, submit to more than one publisher to time, make sure you're really clear about that um, in the proposal so that they're aware. Yes, that's an excellent point, Katie. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Again, that's something that we get asked uh, quite, uh, uh, quite a few times, especially because people try to save on time. And uh, they think that by submitting to more than one publisher actually saves them uh, time, whereas it might not save them the awkwardness of um, uh, having to cancel at a later, later stage. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Another question. Do you accept English translations of already published books in another language? Um, that's a good question. Uh, we do. Um, Katie, do you want to help me out with this? Yeah, of course. Um, yes, so we do accept English translations of previously published work in, say, Japanese. Um, we would still go through the same process. We would still expect to have a book proposal form completed and ideally a sample chapter which has already been translated if the whole work has not already been translated into English. Um, there are a few complications in that we would need to be able to um, have the permission from the original Japanese publisher to publish in English, you need to have retained those rights, um, or we would need to then liaise with the Japanese publisher to release those rights to us to publish in English, for example. Um, so it, it, it can be a case of just us making sure that there is a market in English for something. Um, but if it's, you know, if it's high quality work that's originally been published in Japanese and hasn't yet been seen in English, then absolutely we do a number of those books every year. Um, but as I say, we will have some additional questions about, you know, making sure that we've got the rights to do that um, or, you know, putting us in touch with the Japanese publisher as well. Um, and it helps if either you can translate it or you have a contact who can help translate it, because sometimes finding um, good quality translators who um, are familiar with the subject area as well can be quite tricky. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, do also prospective um, authors need to clarify with the university that they can uh, um, indeed publish 
the same content in, in a book format. Some universities are um, stricter about this process, others um, basically are happy to, you know, get the, the marketing for their institution, if you like. Uh, it's really, it's just really important that you check with all of the kind of stakeholders of your project. If it's been, if the research funding has been attached to, um, you know, a particular funder, make sure that that's okay, there's no issue there. Um, and obviously just think about any sensitivities, um, as Judith said, maybe to do with your institution um, as well. So it is a little bit more complicated, but that shouldn't be a barrier to doing so. Um, and I would encourage you to speak to Andrew if you have a, a potential translation project and he can advise you on a case-by-case -case basis. Yes, I believe your contract actually um, contains reference to this point that authors, uh, prospective authors are in fact free to publish their work with you. And uh, there should be like any um, further legal uh, problems incurred um, should be borne by the, um, the author uh, himself or herself, right? Uh, the wording, I can't remember the wording off the top of my head, but it's essentially we're saying that you need to furnish us with all the information before we're publishing the book. So if somebody's deliberately kind of hiding something or, you know, tell, telling us information isn't true, but generally we would, we would ask to see a contract or we'd ask to see an email or confirmation, a written confirmation from the publisher to make sure that any of that wouldn't happen. Um, so no, we, we would always make sure that we're covered and that the author's covered and any kind of uncertainties on that front, we would make sure are sorted before anybody was publishing anything. Um, I've been doing this for 18, 19 years now. Um, I've never had a situation where, you know, another publisher's come, you know, chasing after us because we, you know, we've published something they weren't happy with. So we would always make sure that we cross all the T's and dot all the I's before anything moved ahead. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely crucial. Thank you so much. Um, also, how do you actually establish authority? Uh, namely, how do you ascertain if the person indeed has uh, uh, the PhD thesis published um, at a certain university? That's a good question. Um, so I would say that uh, during the peer review process, um, or before the peer review process, often when I uh, when I speak to authors, um, speak to researchers, uh, we discuss a lot the uh, research. Um, very often, they'll be really eager to actually show me their work. Um, I've had I've had authors actually uh, send me their PhD theses um, just to show me um, the fields that they're working in. Um, so very often. Uh, most stages throughout the, the process, we have um, we have quality checks in place. Um, the peer reviewers will also um, be aware of this. They'll they'll look into um, who you are. Um, one of the things on the proposal form is that uh, we ask you to include uh, your own uh, curriculum vitae. Uh, so here you would um, give the background of your your education, your PhD, um, yeah, your research topics, uh, your research background. So all of this information, and that's something that uh, our peer reviewers can actually then verify themselves because um, it's one of the things that we really think is important during the proposal stage is that you are actually selling yourself as much as selling the author, um, selling the research that you're doing. So the peer reviewers will actually themselves look into this and just verify that you are who you say you are. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Okay, um, let me have a look if uh, there are any further questions. Yes, um, is there a cap on how many books you actually publish in any given discipline a year? So um, there no, there's not, on there's not a cap. Oh. We don't, um, we aim with every book to ensure that um, there is something original, uh, unique about it. So that whether that's um, a particular focus on a new technology or a new application of an existing technology. Um, so again, with the proposal form, um, authors should be really trying to show they understand the market and the current research um, climate and the current research um, landscape and that they know what is unique um, about their book. So 
this when we go to peer review the peer reviewers will also assess this to make sure um, that what is being published is unique and has uh, brings something new to the table so in this way um, we ensure that you know no matter how many books we do publish in a certain field there's no direct overlap in terms of um, content or um, what is actually being published so there's no cap, but we do ensure that um, there is originality with everything that's being published. Okay. It's, um, it's a really good point because, um, you know, sometimes we have to reject a book proposal, not because um, it's not a good project, but because we've, we've received another book project um, that we've contracted either that same year or previous year, which is really similar or overlap. So I actually had an example this morning, a fantastic new project on, um, preparing and presenting for academic conferences, um, which I think look, looks fantastic. And when I contacted some of my colleagues in our UK head office, we've actually contracted something really similar. And so, unfortunately, I've had to to say, unfortunately, you know, we can't we can't publish things that are you know are too overlapping. We have to make sure there's a market. So, we do always make sure that there's a market. Um, and because we we don't charge any money for publishing, uh, we take on all the publishing costs. Um, and sales and marketing costs for projects. If we publish something and the market isn't there, then, then we will lose money. So it's really important that we make sure that we're only publishing the things we think we can sell. Um, and, uh, you know, it wouldn't be in our best interest to publish anything that, that was just a kind of, you know, just for the numbers. It's, it's very much about the right quality and the right um, projects, which will add to, um, you know, the fantastic publishing out there and engineering. Okay, another query, uh, what's the accepted time uh, between, uh, you know, submitting the first book and if that gets uh, favorable replies and basically submitting a proposal for a second book? Um, you can submit as many proposals as you feel uh, comfortable doing. If you've got different ideas for different book projects, um, then by all means submit. Um, you know, submit, uh, submit as many as you like, um, as long as, like, the, like we say, the quality is there, the uniqueness is there. Um, if you've got the, the energy and the time to submit uh, multiple projects, then please, please do so. We'd be really excited to hear that from you. Yes, very so, important. Yeah, no. It's the time. I think it's the, I think it's the time that can be sometimes, the time is the people benefit. can be a little yeah, bit too... Yeah too enthusiastic about their own, uh, too, um, you know, they think they've got a lot more time than they have. So we would always just, you know, if somebody says they're going to do two books in the space of a year, we would probably say, mm, are you sure? I think there's probably, you know, a timescale um, issue there. So we do sometimes recommend that um, if somebody's doing kind of back-to-back -back projects or, or more than one project in a given space of time, that they, you know, make sure they space them out and give themselves ample time to actually write to it's not enough to just have a book project contracted. You also need to have a realistic plan um, in order to deliver those projects as well. Yes, I, I thought that was a very, very ambitious question. And uh, um, provided that you know this webinar is for early career researchers, yes, absolutely, go for it. If you have the time and uh, if you can keep the within the time frame, then yes. Um, Taylor and Francis provides all the support Yes, uh, next question. Um, do you accept interdisciplinary uh, submissions? And uh, do these get a more favorable treatment than others? So are these um, interdisciplinary um, research publications um, a preferable way of uh, putting a book out there? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, we do, I would say. Um, and as with any, any book, it's really important that you identify the market. Um, so again, the market is a huge con consideration here. Um, if you are submitting a, a multi or interdisciplinary book and, and you've clearly identified that there is a need for this book um, and that there is a market for this book, then by all means, it will be, um, be considered for publication. Um, yeah. Um, with regard to being given favorable treatment, um, I would say not favorable treatment. It will be given the same treatment as um, a more focused uh, monograph or um, focus book. Um, again, kind of regardless really of the content, um, it's really important that you're 
clear about who you're writing for and why you're why you're writing and what you're writing. So yeah, we do accept them, but yeah, just be aware of why and who you're writing for. Okay, thank you so yeah, much. I would just just to add to that, I think um, I think it's really important, as Andrew said, to be really clear about who you're writing for and kind of what you're writing. It can be a little bit of um, in the same way sometimes people say that their book is for kind of all different types of audience because they haven't really thought about who exactly they're, they're, they're kind of writing that book for. In a similar way, um, it's something that's very multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary um, can be because they're not entirely sure where they're aiming it at. So I think it's sometimes a case of just uh, taking a step back and thinking, who is the who is the person, if I had a, an ideal reader, who am I writing this book for? And, you know, what discipline would they be sitting in? And who's going to be the primary audience for this? And maybe it will also be applicable to these other disciplines, but kind of who is the who is the kind of key market? So um, some some books are truly interdisciplinary, but sometimes I think it's a, a sign that someone's a little bit on the fence about exactly what they're trying to do with their book. So um, that's something that we might pick up on in the in the processing of someone's initial proposal in the kind of draft stage. And that might be some feedback we give that, that maybe somebody seems a little bit vague about exactly kind of what they're positioning their book as. Uh, in your presentation, uh, Andrew, you mentioned that um, uh, first uh, uh, authors should actually consult books uh, that have been published in their discipline, you know, in, in similar topics. Um, would mm -hmm. you actually be able to um, have some recommendations for prospective authors if they're unsure what sort of um, book format they um, should be aiming at. So would you be able to send some uh, titles or just ideas of what sort of, you know, scope they should have in mind? Um, so what I'm really happy to do is um, discuss with uh, researchers um, on a Teams call or Zoom call or anything like that, if they're not really sure about what kind of book um, they should be writing. Um, so we can sit and we can discuss um, what your research is about. Um, and then we can kind of you know, bounce some ideas off each other, discuss um, who you would want to write for. And from that, we can then start to think maybe about what would be uh, the most appropriate uh, book type. You know, how much do you want to write? Um, do you want to write a shorter, like short form book? Uh, how much time do you have to write? Do you want to write with colleagues? Do you want to write on your own? There's a lot of questions here to think about. Um, so I'm really happy to just discuss this with people. Um, and then once we've identified that, then we can start looking online about um, similar titles, things that have been published. Um, I think that's a really good way that we can then look and see you know, who's written what, um, what sort of books they've written. And then you can see like the style that they've written, um, the format in which they've written. Um, so by all means, um, yeah, get in contact with me and I'll, I'll be happy to help you out with that. Uh, yes, there is another question about proofreading. If I understand it well, um, the, the person would like to know if um, basically, rather broken English is uh, acceptable in the first proposal and um, you know to what extent uh, would you need assistance explaining the work that you might not understand due to the bad English so how what yeah, so this is, I'm guessing it's like what's the process like you know the the back and forth of you know trying to figure out what um, certain sentences might mean if they're not um, legible in English yeah, so, I mean, this really is one of the most challenging aspects, I think, for non-native English speaking authors is um, really getting your thoughts down in English that is legible and understandable. Um, it's really, it's really difficult. I mean, I, I struggle with it really with Japanese, so I really, I really sympathise uh, writing in another language. Um, what I would say is that in the, um, the proposal, I think it's really important to make sure that uh, the English is really of a high quality. Um, the reviewers are basing their assessment on the documents that they receive. So they're basing their assessment on the proposal, on the abstracts, on the sample chapter. Um, 
they do understand that the book itself will be um, copy edited and that that will be um, the language in the book will be polished up to a high standard. Um, but um, I would say that it is a very good idea to make sure that the English in the proposal and in the abstract is of a high standard. So if possible, if necessary, then I would recommend that you do get that edited as well. Um, in that way, then it really reflects very well on you because the reviewers will see this. They'll really understand what your research is about. Um, and they'll really understand, I think, what your book will look like once it's been uh, written. If you submit something where the English is, um, is not so high quality, um, it can be a bit of a have a bit of a negative effect because um, the reviewers might not understand exactly what you're trying to say or what the focus of your research is, and so this can then have uh, negative effects when they would say you know it might need major revisions when in reality all that's necessary is the language polishing. Um, so yes, my advice would be um, write your proposal and submit it. Um, I'll take a look at it and I will make an assessment on that um, and then we'll have a discussion about um, what needs to be done. Um, you know, you might not need to have the entire proposal edited. There may only be some, a few sentences that are a little unclear. In that case, I'm more than happy to help out, um, offer my advice and expertise there. Um, but basically, I recommend that the English in the proposal and in the supporting abstract and um, sample chapter should have a high standard English. Thank you so much. I am looking at questions, but I do not see any more. Let me have a look in the Q&A box in the chat. I've seen one um, from Tony um, asking about the life cycle of the monograph um, and how long a, a book is, is kind of, um, yeah, how long the life cycle of a, of a monograph is. Apologies, um, yes, I think I've, I've skipped that. Yes, how, so how long is the life cycle of a monograph in social and all natural sciences? Indeed, thank you, Katie. Andrew, do you want to answer that? Um, can I pass that to you? Is that okay? Okay, so um, generally we ask, and actually it's one of the questions we do ask in the proposal form is kind of how long do you think something's going to be up to date? And we're partly asking really for the author to tell us if there's something about the, the book that they're publishing that is going to be um, relevant sort of now and we need to publish it quite quickly, but perhaps it's going to, um, you know, make it um, outdated in, in, a, in a few years. But generally books should be uh, relevant for sort of five to ten years. They, we don't expect things to just, um, you know, go out of date very quickly, partly because um, in order to write a book, that there needs to be enough research being done in order to put together, you know, 15, 60,000 words. And so generally when you find that that research has been building up over a number of years rather than something that someone's just decided to do that year. Um, but we are finding things, for example, at the moment on the COVID pandemic, um, which potentially um, will have a shorter lifespan because inevitably they're based on kind of current events. So it, it doesn't really matter to us in terms of when we're assessing the proposal, other than just understanding from the author's point of view, um, you know, what the kind of potential life cycle of that book might be and how, how long it might stay relevant. Um, but generally, the answer would normally be five to ten years. Um, because Routledge does, uh, sorry, CRC Press does a, um, a print on demand for books, our books don't generally go out of print. We tend to keep them um, keep them active, even our, we have a very deep backlist, I think, as Andrew mentioned. So those books, if somebody wants to order them, we will print them on demand and send them to customers um, or readers. It doesn't have to, you know, we're not sort of sitting with a huge warehouse full of books anymore. So it just means that, that things can stay active a lot longer in the past. Um, things would go out of print because, you know, we've printed a, you know, however many thousands of copies, um, and then once they were gone, unless we felt there was enough to reprint them, we wouldn't necessarily do another print. Um, those days of publishing have, have passed by now. We're a much more agile business, so we can we can keep things active for a lot longer. So 
you know, our backlist um, of titles, um, you know, still get orders um, for books that are 10 or more years old. So um, that's the kind of longevity of, of how something um, stays active. And then in terms of the book proposal life cycle, um, I think Andrew mentioned that in the actual presentation that um, generally, you know, um, it depends a little bit on how long somebody will take to write the book. Um, but we have a, you know, eight to 12 weeks um, in terms of the proposal itself. And then however long, six months to two years, it takes for someone to write the book. And then it takes us about six months to publish. So that should give you the whole life cycle of a book project. Thank you very much, Katie. Any further questions? Nothing in the Q&A box. And let me look through the chat again. Yes, I think that was the last query um, about the monograph. Yes. Well, um, if there are no further questions at this point, then I would like to ask our audience to submit their questions via email to japan at europeoscience.net. Uh, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and we also upload regularly information on our portal. And you can also contact Andrew. You can still see his uh, email address and Twitter handle on the screen. I would like to thank uh, Katie and Andrew for uh, giving their time to us today and our audience for um, attending. I do enjoy publishing webinars uh, because this is one of the best way to interact with um, researchers. And uh, I would like to encourage you to subscribe to the mailing list of Europe South Japan to receive information about upcoming Taylor and Francis um, webinars on publishing. We will still have one session this autumn. And uh, those of you who are looking to publish in different disciplines, I do recommend that you check our portal regularly. Thank you again for coming and a very warm goodbye. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.